Thank you very much. Welcome everyone on this holiday weekend. I appreciate Ray Green last week filling in for me. A great message we watched online. I can remember the three points, action, passion, and altitude. Did I get it right? Hey, first service, I tripped them. I couldn't remember. <laughs> that was embarrassing, you know. <laughs> but I hope you remember them, but uh, it doesn't hurt the, you know, we can go back and listen to messages more than once. Isn't that, that's pretty cool that you get to do that and be able to capture maybe some things and reinforce others. So appreciate his, him being willing to fill in for us. I had a, almost a picture to sh show you. I forgot to download it today. You know, l last week's message, I talked about my debacle with my sister, on roses versus carnations. You remember that story? So she listened to the sermon. I didn't know. So, so I had to go get some roses this week and present to her, and I took a picture of it. So we made everything good. So she got her roses finally after all these years. And, and so I've, I got to be careful what I say because I don't know who's listening, right? <laughs> but we're glad you're here today. And those who are joining us online, we're going to be bringing our series on Jesus 40 Days uh, to. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll be bringing that to a conclusion. Remember, Jesus started his ministry with 40 days in the wilderness, right? Remember that? That's why he kicked it all off. Now he's ending his ministry here on earth with 40 days after the resurrection. And it's a very important 40 days because he's getting the disciples ready for what they don't even know for sure what's coming, but Jesus knows these days are going to be very important. And today we're going to be joining Jesus on the beach. Who likes to go to the beach? You know, some, some of you, I know my neighbors, Fred and Linda, they love the beach. They go all the time to the beach. Well, Jesus is a beach person too, and he's going to join seven of his disciples on the beach, but he's actually coming after one of them, even though they're all there. He's coming for Peter. And this is going to be a very intimate time. One of my favorite portions of scripture as Jesus engages Peter on the beach. And John chose this story to end his last chapter of the gospel of John. And you see Peter's kind of in a pickle. He, he's had a major failure. Now, he's not a stranger to failure. He's had a lot of fit. Are you, anybody here glad Peter's in the Bible? I'm glad he's there. I, anybody here connect with him? He's, he's there to relate to, right? I mean, constantly. He's the only disciple who could wear the badge where Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. I mean, <laughs> that's not an honor you necessarily wanted, but it was, it, it, that's an example. He cut off the ear of one of those who came to arrest Jesus, and Jesus had to tell him, put it away, Peter, put it away. If you live by the sword, you die by the sword. But I'm sure glad Peter's there because he, he responds quickly to things. Most of his problems has to do with uh, speaking too quickly. Does anyone here relate to that besides me? You know, boy, I'm learning an acronym. It's called WAIT, W-A-I-T. Why am I talking? <laughs> it's a good to just wait. So if we could just wait, we could save ourselves some problems. Well, Peter's got some things he said that he wish he could uh, probably take back. Uh, because he's, one of his biggest failures was very public and was before even his disciples. What do you do when you feel like a failure? Because that's the way Peter felt. Peter felt like a failure. You, have you ever been there where you, especially Peter, he made this big boast and then it didn't pan out for him. His failure was public. Some of your, any, I want to make sure I'm talking to the right group. Is there anyone here who's never failed? Two people. That's good. Praise <laughs> the Lord. <laughs> That's a pretty good percentage, let me tell you. Yeah. Failure is something that we all probably will experience. If you haven't already, you will. You know, when you, especially when this failure with God, where we, we make these incredible boasts sometimes, and then we're not able to live up to them. In Luke 22, we, Luke recorded for us such an example of Peter's experience when the Lord told them, he said, I'm going to go, I'm going to die on the cross. And then he tells them, I don't know why, I don't think Peter was listening closely. He said, you are all, all going to desert me. You think if you heard that, you would zip it, Right? All of us, all of us, but Peter speaks up, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison and even die for you. Jesus said to him, Peter, 
before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you even know me. Peter goes, not going to happen. Not going to happen. But we know it did. You ever had such an experience? I always like to think, I don't know how many of you, I know in the Assemblies of God we have camps during the summer. And you go out there for a whole week. Anybody had this experience? And you spend a whole week with the Lord, and you get so stirred up and so passionate, worship every night. And, I, and then there's the open mic at the end of the week, right? And people get up and, I'm never going to sin again. Glory to God. And you think, man, I think he's right. I, I, I think he probably won't, but he will. But we make those boasts and we make those, have you ever said, I will never, but you did. Have you ever made those kind of, listen, you're, you're normal. We, we've all been there, right? Maybe you've been to a conference and after the end of the week, you're so pumped and excited, you're going to take on the world, aren't you? And you make all these promises and commitments. Or you come to a church service and you have great worship and you leave out of here and, and yet it doesn't seem to take long and all of a sudden the things that I committed to and the things I proclaimed, I struggle with. And I feel like a failure. Have you ever been there? In Matthew 26, we find Peter's failure. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard. Jesus had been arrested and he drew near and there was a servant girl there, and she said to him, you were with Jesus of Galilee. I recognize you. He denied it. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow, he was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again. He made an oath. I don't know that man. In fact, in Mark, it seems to suggest that one of the people who identified him was a relative of the guy who he cut the ear off when they arrested Jesus. That would have been fast. I know. I can't forget you. I know who you are. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. And then he began to curse. And he swore to them, I don't know him. And immediately, a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the words that Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And Peter went outside and he wept bitterly. What was he feeling? He's feeling the shame. He felt like a failure. He had made this boast before the Lord and all the disciples heard him. And now the actual complete opposite of what he said he would do is what he ended up doing. Well, Jesus is coming for Peter today. He's coming for him, and he's coming for us as well. And he, and he understands Peter's feeling of a failure. He knows, and, and he's wanting to communicate something to him and to us today, all of us, and is this. It's the title of my message. Failure is not final. That is the message he's bringing to the beach because Peter's, and all the disciples know what happened. Everybody knows. They probably talked about it a little bit. And, and here, this is the third time he's met with the disciples. But now he's coming. Peter doesn't know it, but he's coming for him. He's drawing near to him in, in this feeling of, of being a failure. And he's, he's wanting to restore him. And we have much to learn from this. And we're, in fact, take out your little insert. We're going we're gonna to look at a few things that we can learn from this. But let's pick up our text. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. And you can just follow along with me, all right? In chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Later Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, the rest said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. They knew there was someone there, but they couldn't make him out. And you'll see he was about 100 yards away. That's a football field. So, yeah, there's somebody there, but we're not sure who it is. Look at verse 5. He calls out to them, fellows, in the Greek it really says boys, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did, 
and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the, disi- then the disciple Jesus loved, who's that? John, who's writing this? John, right? He's painting himself into the story. Uh, he says to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that, that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic for he had stripped off for work and he jumped into the water and he headed to shore. Verse eight, the other stayed with the boat. Yeah, that's Peter, that's what he does. We'll let him go ahead. We're coming behind him. They stayed with the boat and they pulled the loaded net to the shore for they were only about a hundred yards from shore. When they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them. Fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There was 153 large fish, and yet the net had not torn. Fascinating, don't you think? Uh, here, he, how, why, 100, why, why the 153? Why not round it up? Why, why not just say a lot of fish? I have met very few fishermen who do, who do not count their fish, right? They'll tell you, they know exactly how many fish they caught. And I've seen people try to make this very significant, 153. What does it mean? It means 153 fish. That's what it means. And what they're trying to say is, this net should have broke, but it did not. You see, when God's making provision, he can, he can strengthen your net. And you can have a capacity that you would never have without him. And here they were. And Jesus is, he's, everything he does has a purpose. He's communicating something. There's something he wants to say to Peter. We're going to see it in the story. Can we pick up verse 12 and 14? Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. This was the third time. Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. So we're going to look at three ways that Jesus responds to our failures. Assuming you've all experienced it, it's important to you know that the way Jesus responds to Peter is the way he's responding to us too. Uh, I, I don't know how you feel, but this failure thing, uh, it's kind of still with me. Uh, there's times when I fall short of the things I've declared, the commitments I've made, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and I, and I somehow fall short. I still experience that, do you? So how does Jesus feel about it? How does he feel about us? How do you feel about Peter? We're going to, do three, we're going to look at three, three responses, okay? Here's the first one. Every time, I want you to know this, when you're, when you're feeling like a failure, Jesus always responds with presence and prayer. Presence and prayer. I want you to notice something here. Jesus pursued Peter. Jesus went looking for him. Jesus didn't wait for him to come look. He, he went to the, he knew they would be there and he went there. I want you to know Jesus is that way with you and me. He's always pursuing us. When we fail, what do we have a tendency to do? We withdraw, don't we? We feel shame. We feel we're maybe embarrassed, especially if it's a failure I've had over and over and over and over and over again in my life, and I can't seem to get victory over it, and maybe I made some public declaration about it, and here I am. Well, that makes me just want to sit down and withdraw, but I want you to know the heart of Jesus for you, even in your failure, and I don't care what it is, you can, whatever it is, it doesn't matter, he's coming after you. He's pursuing you. The enemy will tell you, no, he's turned his back on you. He's walking away from you. You're a failure. He wants nothing to do with you. That is not true. I want you to know Jesus is coming after you. Even in your failure, he's pursuing you. His presence is always there. He's not running away. He's running after. The prodigal son is a great example of that, isn't it? And that was a parable that Jesus told, trying to show us the heart of the father. The prodigal fails. He leaves. He's a failure. He comes back. The father sees him a far way off. And what does he do? What's he do in the story? He runs to him. He runs. Those who heard that story would think that was, that was ludicrous. You don't do that. The father does not run, but this father does. This father runs. And he didn't wait for him to get back home. He went after him. He didn't even let him speak. And he wrapped his arms around him and hugged him. I want you to know that's God's heart for you. And if you failed or you've been a prodigal or you, you've made commitments and It just didn't pan out. I want you to know that he's coming after you and his presence is there. He's he's always going to be with you and and I want you to know he knows. 
Luke 22. Luke tells us a little side of, this, of Peter's denial that the other gospels don't give us. And it was something Jesus said to Peter. Listen to this. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Well, there's a lot of theology. Well, you mean Satan has to ask permission to sift me? I don't know about that. I don't know. I don't know. I just know that's what Jesus said. He's asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon. What? Are you getting this? I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, you will strengthen your brothers. Boy, there's a lot there, isn't there? You know, in your failure, sometimes God will use your failure to minister to other people. Because you'll come through it, and it'll become part of your story, and part of your life, and part of your testimony. And you'll be able to speak into people's lives, all because of your failure. Notice he says here, I prayed for you. That's past tense. Anybody getting this? Jesus already knew the failure was coming before it came. Is that encouraging to you? That Jesus already knows my mess-ups before they happen? So he's not surprised by them. And he's already taken a position of prayer and intercession for me. And what does he pray? I'm praying that your faith will not fail. Was Jesus' prayer not answered? Looks to me like his faith failed. He denied him. No, that's not. Listen, something you've got to understand about faith. Faith does not keep you from failing necessarily. It doesn't keep you from stumbling, but it helps you get back up again. Because remember, there were two people that denied Christ that night. There was Judas and there was Peter and there was two very different outcomes because one's faith did not fail him because what's he say? When you turn back to me, what is that? That's called repentance because Jesus is praying for you. He's praying. He already knows what's happening. You, don't, you can't inform him about the Lord. You won't believe what happened. Oh, I knew about it already, and I've already been praying for you. I've been interceding for you, and that your faith will not fail, because faith does not keep me from failing, but it does help me get back up again when I trip and fumble. Listen to this in Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is able to have to save completely those who come to God through him, because why? Because he always lives to intercede for them. Is that, did you know that? Did you know Jesus lives to intercede for you? He's praying for you right now, right now. He's praying for you by name. Romans 8, 34 says the same thing. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who has raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. That should encourage you even in, in your failure even when you stumble to know, I know, and the enemy's coming and telling me what a scumbag I am and how I have no right to be a pastor. I shouldn't stand behind this pulpit. You, you know, I'm, and he'll give you all your dirty laundry. Everything comes, you, you how, how can you? And, and you, hey, I know Jesus is praying for me right now. He's interceding for me. He knows about my struggle. Revelation 3.20, one of my favorite scriptures is Jesus stands at the door and knocks. He's talking to the church, isn't he? I'm standing, I'm knocking, and anyone who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into them, and I will sup with them, and they with me. I like the way the NLT says it. I'll come in, and we'll have a meal together as friends. Do you see Jesus that way? I believe he's on the beach, and he's knocking. And Peter's going to open the door. And Jesus has got a breakfast plan for him. Did you know that's the heart of Jesus? He wants to be intimate with us. He wants to fellowship with us. Well, you got the wrong group, Jesus. These guys are a bunch of losers. I don't know how you ever picked them because none of them seem to get it. In fact, you know, how many of you caught it when Jesus said, he didn't just say, Peter, you will deny me. He said, you'll all deny me. And when Peter made the profession, did you read the last sentence that said, and they all agreed. They all made that profession and they all failed. Every one of them. Jesus knew it. Jesus knew it. But he knew he was going to take the, their failure and he was going to re do something magnificent with it. Amen. That's Jesus' heart for us. Here's the second thing. Jesus responds with an awareness of our weakness. I call it process patience. Do you see it in Jesus? He's so patient with these disciples. They keep messing up. They keep not, they're not comprehending what's going on. But Jesus stays in there with them. He's always coming after them. He's patient because he understands something. He understands process. And he understands our weakness, all of us. I don't care who you are. Now, some people like to appear more spiritual than other people. You're all weak. We're all weak. We're all weak. And I love, I'm going to jump down to the last verse listed there, John 1.42, because this is when Jesus first met Peter. Do you remember it? It's in John 1.42. Andrew brings Jesus 
He, he brings Simon to Jesus. And here's what happens. He says, he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked intently at Simon. And he said this. Your name is Simon. You're the son of John. But you will be called Cephas. Notice he's not talking present tense. He's talking process. And, and Jesus, he's, this is what you're going to become. And that name means Peter. In Aramaic, Cephas. In Greek, Peter. They both mean the same thing. Rock. He said, you're going to be a rock. Right now, you're not rock, Peter. You're not rock. You're in process. Listen, I know, and, and, and Peter's going to live. He's, he's going to be in that process. We're going to see, you can go all through the New Testament. You'll see the process. And then in a couple of weeks, we're going to see Peter preaching a sermon at Pentecost, and 3,000 people are going to get saved. How in the world do you take an utter failure and you use him as a mighty man of God in the church? It's what God does because he was pursuing him. He was praying for him. He prayed that his faith would remain. In fact, his very failure was going to be used by God in ministering to other people. And, and he was very aware of his weakness, and he, but he understood the process. He understood the process. And that's why he was so patient with these guys, because he knew the end game. How about Proverbs twenty four sixteen? The godly may trip up seven times, but they always get up again. Here's what you got to know about faith. It, it doesn't keep you from falling. Faith does not keep you from failing. It lets you get back up again. That's what faith, that's what Jesus prayed for Peter. Your faith will not fail you. I'm not saying, Peter, you won't deny me because you will. In fact, you're going to deny me three times. You're going to curse. You're going to claim you never knew me. But your faith is good because that faith is going to help you get back up. And when you return to me, you're going to strengthen the brethren. I'll tell you, I like to follow people who walk with a limp. I don't like to follow people who, They almost give you the impression that they're perfect and they never sin and they never have issues. You need to be leery of those people. I like, I want to, I want to follow somebody. It's not just theory, but they've had the experience. They went through it and they've come out the other side. That's why Jesus is letting them have this experience. Hebrews 4, another great scripture. I I read this often. It's just a reminder to me of who Jesus is and how he responds to us. It, It says, so when, since we have this high priest who has entered into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. Here it is. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. Do you see him that way? He is sympathetic with your weakness. I know the enemy's whispering something else to you. He's telling you to run away. Jesus has said, now I'm going to chase you. I understand your struggle. I know what you're going through. For he faced all of the same test we do, yet he did not sin. So let's come boldly. Where? To the throne of grace. There we will receive his mercy. Who's mercy for? The guilty. We will receive mercy. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. They hold hands together and We are partakers of it. We will find grace to help us when we need it most. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. We know this well. Paul's talking about his thorn in the flesh and and he's praying for God to remove it. And I, I love the response that's recorded for us in 2 Corinthians 12. God says to him, my grace is all you need. It is sufficient And my power is perfected and works best in your weakness. In fact, God takes these these men who are all failures, every last one of them, and in their weakness, he perfects his power through them. And this whole experience that Peter's going through, it's going to help position him to let God use him in a powerful way. Now, this, this story, I love it, this fishing story, where this, is this the first time Peter's had this experience with Jesus? No. In fact, when he first had this encounter, it's recorded back in Luke 5. There was another time they fished and didn't catch anything. It was a fishless trip, and Jesus showed up, and he preached. And it's recorded for us, when he had finished speaking, he turned to Simon, and he says, Now go out where it is deeper and let down your net to catch some fish. Master Simon replied, We worked hard all last night, and we didn't catch anything. But if you say so, I will let the nets down again. And this time, 
their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. Now, I want you to see the similarities and the things that are different. What's different about these two stories? They were similar. They're both in catching fish. This time, the nets are breaking. In our story today, the nets do not break. Look, a shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus. He said, oh, Lord, leave me, full man. Something's happened to Peter since then. Now he's arrogant and prideful. I will never, I will never. Jesus wants to remind him of his first encounter. And he wants him to humble himself. That's self-sufficiency, self-absorption. It, it's, it's poison to us. And so he's taking him back. Notice how he addresses him in our story today. He doesn't call him Simon Peter. What's he calling? Who is he? Simon, son of John. What's he doing? He's taking him back. He's taking him back to the first time. That's where he was when he first met him. For he said, you shall be called Cephas. And that took a few years and Philippi is when he first addressed him that way. But here in our story today, he keeps calling him. He's wanting him to remember back to that incident where you first met me. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught as were the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they were all amazed. And Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus and what is Jesus doing? He's taking him back to that because today he's going to ask him to do the same thing. I want you to follow me. You become very arrogant. You become very prideful. I want you to go back to that place of humility and realize your total dependence is on me. He wants him to know I am sympathetic with your weakness and I am very patient with the process because I know how everything's going to end. He prophesied, was it just prophecy? He knew he, knew, he knows your future. He knows the, the little dilemmas you're going to put yourself in. He knows what kind of failures you're going to, what kind of decisions you're going to make that are totally wrong. He's going to be there. He's going to be praying for you. His presence is going to be there. He's going to pursue. He's going to be sympathetic with your weaknesses. And, he, and through your weakness, God's power is going to be perfected. See, after this event, Peter can no longer go, <laughs> hey, look at me. He doesn't do that anymore. He's back to the beginning. Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. He recognizes his position in Christ. Let's keep reading. Verse 15. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, there he is, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs. Jesus told him, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep. Jesus said a third time, he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked him the question a third time. His question, the first question is simple, do you love me more than these? What's these? Is it the job? Is it the boat? Is it the fish? Don't you remember what Peter said? Though all these will deny you, I will not. Could it be these disciples? Do you love me more than anything, Peter? And then he asked him three times. He's by a charcoal fire. Charcoal fire only occurs two times. In his denial, he was around a charcoal fire and here on the beach. Do you think Jesus set this up as an object lesson for him? He's wanting to know. I knew all about it. I still love you, Peter, but now I want you, to, I want you to entertain this important question. Do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? Keep reading verse 17. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and you went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. Verse 20, Peter turned around. He saw behind them the disciple Jesus loved, the one who had leaned over to Jesus during supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? 
Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? Jesus replied, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. So the rumor spread among the community of believers that this disciple would die. But that isn't what Jesus said at all. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Do we still do that with scripture? We do, don't we? We take the words and we kind of make it say something. It's really not saying nothing new there, but what an interesting encounter that he is having. And Jesus has set this all up because he's pursuing Peter. Here's the last response, I think. Jesus responds by calling him and calling us back to selfless love. This is the foundation of everything. He wants him to know that. All the problems you've had, Peter, all the things that have happened to you, this is where we got to come back to, Peter, because this is where it all happens. It's, it's my love for you and your love for me. He's asking, do you love me, Peter? Do you love me? Three times, does it, does it relate to the three denials? Probably. I don't know if that's exactly it, but he keeps he, he keep challenging him. Do you agape me? Do you agape me? Peter keeps saying, well, I phileo you, I phileo you. We're friends, you know, we're brothers, you know. And in the end, Jesus then comes, do you phileo me, really, Peter? Lord, you know everything. You know what? He's right. God does know everything. He wanted Peter to know. Yeah. He, God knows, but does Peter know? And sometimes God will ask you questions he already knows the answer to. He asked him if they didn't catch any fish. He already knew they hadn't caught any fish. He wanted them to respond. He's saying, Lord, you know I love you. And, and Jesus knew. Yeah, I know you really do love me, Peter, but I'm calling you now back to this place. It's where we all began. In John 1, or John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Did you know love is what motivates obedience? It's not, I have to, it's not just discipline. You know, I gotta do this. I don't gotta do it, I get to do it. You know, sometimes our disobedience is, is not a, it's not a discipline problem, it's a love problem. Because if you love him, how will you live? Everything comes out of love. He, Peter's going to need this because what's coming, he can't even imagine. So Peter's getting, Jesus is getting Peter ready. He's got this process patience. He knows, hey, listen, these guys, they don't look like it right now. Man, in fact, they look the opposite. They, everything seems contrary to hope, but Jesus knows, just wait, just wait. He sees you that same way. And that's why we never should write somebody off. We should never draw a line through someone's name. That guy, he's always dropping the ball. Hey, wait, God's not done yet. And he's not done with me. He's not done with you. In Luke 7, there's an incredible story in the Bible. You know it, right? Jesus goes to a house. He's invited for dinner. And a woman comes in, and she starts to wash his feet. And, of course, the owner of the home, the one who's the host of the event, becomes very disturbed that Jesus doesn't know who this woman is. If he, if he was really a prophet, wouldn't he know? Well, I want you to know, he knows all right. Of course, the question is, how does that guy know? <laughs> he knows too, and how do he figure it out? Yeah, he's being a little self-righteous, right? And, but Jesus knows exactly, and he's, he says these words. And I want you, don't think about her, I want you to think about you today. Because she is me. She is me, and she is you. Jesus says, I tell you, her sins, they are many. And they have been forgiven. Her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. You see where, where he's taking Peter? He said, Peter, I know you're embarrassed about what you did. I already knew you were going to do it before you did it. I want you to know I love you, and I, but I, and I want you to love me. Because I'm forgiving you. He's saying to Peter, I forgive you for what you did. And because of that, what should be our response? Love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What is Jesus calling Peter back to? In our time of failure, this is where we got to come back to. We got, we got to understand Jesus is praying for us. He's interceding for us. He's sympathetic with our weakness. He's not running from us. He's running towards us. He's pursuing us. And he's calling us back to what the foundation of everything, and that is his love for us and our love for him. In Revelations 2-4, there, there was this great church that, man, I read it and I go, I want to pastor that church. 
Man, they had the doctrine down right. They were doing works for God. It was everything. And I thought at the end they would get a, a little ribbon. And Jesus said to them in verse 4, I do have this against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. This is what Jesus is doing with Peter. He's calling him back to where it all started. I'm calling you back to that place. I want you to, I want, I want you to come back to that place when I first met you, Peter. I prophesied, and, and that first encounter we had in the boat, yeah, we want to go back to that. See, I've done all this to remind you of it, and now I'm getting you ready. You're entering into a whole new place of ministry. It's going to blow your mind. And you, the most least likely to succeed, I am going to empower and use. And we're going to see that in a couple of weeks. And I want to close with this scripture of 1 Corinthians 13. You know it well. I just want to read it because I think this is how God loves us. But he's also making a very important statement. Paul does later talking about love and how important love is. to me. Whatever you're going to do in the future, Peter, it's going to be because you love me. If you do it for any other reason, you're going to miss the boat. And you already know I love you. In fact, he, Paul says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love, I would have gained nothing. And he describes this love. Isn't this the way God loves us? Love is patient. It's kind. It is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It doesn't keep a record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but it rejoices whenever the truth wins out. This love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful. It endures through every circumstance. I like that word, endurance, to remain under without being crushed. Jesus knew you're going to need this love, Peter, because you're going to go through some things. You guys, in fact, you're all going to die for me. And it, by the way, Peter, here's how you're going to die, just so you know. I already know. Do you know Jesus knows how you're going to die? He knows the very second you will breathe your last breath. So you can let that go, can't you? Everybody talks about, I, I'm done with that. I, I have no fear of death. God already knows the very moment I'm going to breathe my last you see, he's calling them here. Listen, you're going to need this because love, if you love, you can go through anything. And Peter, you're going to need this. I'm calling you back to your love. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages, special knowledge, it will become useless. But love will last forever. So, do you feel like a failure today? You're in good company. We will experience it. And we're not done with it. It's still going to knock at my door. I still have this tendency in me where I make these bold statements and then I fail at them and, but you know I, I believe what's true for Peter is true for me today and it's true for you so we're all coming in the same attitude same spirit same awareness and I want you to know Jesus this is how he's responding to you even 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 in your sin even in your failure he's pursuing you he's praying for you he's interceding for you his presence is with you and he's calling you back to your love for him and his love for you he's restoring you and he wants us to walk in this supernatural love. That's what God calls Peter to. It's, he's calling us to that as well. We're going to come to the table this morning. And we're going to reflect on the, the words that Jesus spoke over that woman in Luke 7. Except I want you to make it personal today. It's not about her. It's about you. She's dead. You're alive. So let's read the story as if it was you. Therefore, I tell you, your many sins have been forgiven. True? As your great love has shown, whoever has been forgiven little loves little. So can we say whoever's been forgiven much loves much? You should be the best lover of all because you have been forgiven much. It's not on the screen, but in Philippians 1.9, Paul writes to the churches, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. That's God's heart for us. I don't care if you've stumbled. I don't care if you've fallen. I don't care if you've messed. I don't care. This is God's heart for you today. Amen? So it's not about perfection. It's about direction. God's calling Peter. He's calling us. Who need to hear this today? Amen? We're going to come to the table, and we're going to receive the cup, and then we have a word that God's given to somebody 
to speak over this congregation.